uh, lab in Athens uh, of the National Technical University of Athens and I will try to give you a short introduction of primes. Maybe I will skip something depending on what the time looks like. Um, so just uh, a small introdu general introduction. So primes, which many people have asked, is a price-induced market equilibrium uh, system. It's an energy system model, and it has been developed by the Energy Economy uh, and Environment, so E3 modeling lab in, at the National Technical University of Athens. Um, it has been peer-reviewed twice within the European Commission in 97 and in 2011. And uh, it has quite a long story by now. So at the, from the very beginning in 93-94, the Primes model was designed to focus on market-related mechanisms and to explicitly project prices that uh, influence the evolution of energy demand and supply and the technology development. Um, the model has been designed in a modular way, which aims at representing agent behavior and uh, their interactions in multiple mar markets. Um, the model combines a microeconomic foundation with engineering, a uh, bottom-up uh, representation of technologies to simulate the structural changes and uh, the long-term transitions which are required. So the geographical coverage, we cover all the EU plus several uh, non-European EU countries. Um, it has also the trade of electricity, gas and other fuels between Europe and the rest of the world. Uh, the time frame, uh, it uh, runs from 2015 basically to 2050 with an extension to 2070 in five year time periods. Um, the models are absolutely calibrated to Eurostat for the period from 1990 to 2010-15. Um, the core of the model is the, are the market-linked sub-models of the demand side, so industry services and households, um, with the power steam generation and fuel supply system. The satellite models are the Prime's biomass supply, the Prime's refinery, the Prime's remove transport run model, which runs both in the core and as an independent model. Then we also have a Eurasian gas supply model and a hydrogen supply model. So what is the approach? So the exogenous are obviously the economic activity, the world energy prices, technology parameters and the policies and measures which are to be introduced. Um, the sequence of model interaction, so we have agents which represent which are representative for the different sectors and they act in individual optimizations for their profit or welfare uh, these are influenced by behavioral aspects such as um, comfort but also risk uh, technology system reliability and they use individual discount rates, so each sector has basically his own discount rate for capital budgeting decisions. Um, so we have basically accordingly all the energy flows, the investment and the choice of technologies which are split by vintages. Um, demand and supply of energy commodities interact in a market with an assumed competition regime. <coughs> um, there is therefore a simultaneous energy and, if required, emissions or certificate market clearance, uh, which determines the prices and the balance of demand and supply. Um, then some details to the commodity tariffs, etc. So we use the ramsey boitier pricing methodology, which recovers all fixed costs and uh, determines the distribution of the tariffs across all sectors. Um, the market equilibrium spans across the uh, entire time horizon with investment being endogenous. Um, sectorial restrictions apply, for example, if there are carbon dioxide emissions which are in the ETS, so only cover some sectors or for whatever other targets which apply. Um, what are the mathematics behind the model? So it solves a concatenated mixed so a sequence of mixed uh, complementarity problems with equilibrium conditions and overall constraints such as carbon, um, etc. So basically it's an um, 
equilibrium problem with equilibrium constraints. Um, <clears throat> what is the foresight? So um, it is built into the decisions of the agents, so it depends on the lifetime of the equipment, so every sector has um, a different uh, vision of foresight. For some sectors it is obviously very myopic, whereas the market equilibrium is intertemporal. Um, we have explicit technologies in the model, so we are able to simulate technology dynamics, the vintages over time, how the new technologies penetrate, and how we have also a system of inertia from the past because of the capital stock which remains. Ooh, this should not be in here. Okay, something has gone wrong with the version of the presentation. Which is not good. It's the wrong version. I don't know why. Okay, well, I'll present it in this way. It's not the picture I was <laughs> <laughs> expecting. We have made a better picture, but okay, it will now go with this picture. Um, uh, okay, so basically we have, um, this shows what are the different interactions of the model. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, the demand side, which are each a separate model. So there's the residential and the services and agricultural sectors, the industrial module and the transport model in the primes to remove model. So that is basically the demand side. Then on the other side, which all flows into primes, is the power sector energy modeling, which is split into district heating, industrial CHP and boilers, and obviously the primary fossil fuel production. These two parts basically go in and are the parts which describe the core part of the primes modeling, whereas the bottom parts are the hydrogen, the primes, biomass, the radiation, natural gas supply and the refineries, which run independently, but in interaction with the primes. Obviously, as was described, and here there are also some things missing, but okay. Um, so basically, obviously, as is the case with other models, there are part things that we do not cover in our own models, but which are obviously essential for the analysis we cover. So obviously, there's the connection to the macroeconomics, which we generally use GEMI-3. There is the connection to the world fuel prices, which are not simulated directly in primes. So we generally, we use Prometheus lately, but otherwise also poles can be used, which is a very common model. We also have connections uh, to the non-CO2 because we have to have the targets for the overall GHD, so for that we use the GAINS, which is uh, developed at uh, YASA. And then we also have, uh, which is missing from this picture, um, the connections to the land use side, where we use also from YASA the Globium and the Capri, which was mentioned yesterday, so that we have at the end an overall system. Um, recently, and but maybe I could jump this, I don't know, of the time, I haven't checked. Um, okay, um, we have recently developed an enhanced electricity model, as it's been a bit of a theme also yesterday. Um, so uh, there we have a much higher model resolution and uh, the model runs for the whole of Europe together and not individually for the countries. So there we have all major plants, uh, so power plants in Europe, represented individually. We have a separate handling of the CHP plants, which are by name and type. Of the district heating, then of sewage, landfill, gas and waste, and of the industrial plants, which are identified by sector, in order to uh, grasp the different characteristics of the boilers and CHP plants in the different industrial sectors, which are very different. Uh, okay, we also have obviously all the rest uh, by type, and we have uh, hydro by type, uh, including all the issues of pump storage, etc. Um, we have obviously a long list of uh, candidate technologies for investment. Uh, we have uh, the new types of storage, so batteries, air compression, power to hydrogen, power to gas. Um, what are the model functionalities? So we have our dispa hourly dispatching in this, we have a full network modeling, we have a simulation of the wholesale markets. Uh, there is also the distribution between centralized and decentralized uh, power systems, and uh, we simulate investment under uncertainty and oligopoly. Um, what are the market design issues which can be addressed through these pro uh, projections? So obviously priority dispatch and rest cult containment, uh, issues related to capacity mechanisms, 
the NTCs, which might be restricting the flows, uh, and we have a monetization of the reliability uh, in the model. Uh, so um, the value of the loss of load, the value of risk containment, the value of flexibility loss, and the value of capacity adequacy. I will jump this for now and do the rest of the policy focus. So that was the focus of the enhanced model. Um, so here, I mean, we have had a long experience now in primes, in particular for doing major policy analysis and impact assessment. We have been working um, for the European Commission for a long time, uh, but we also work for national governments and industrial organizations. Uh, and over time, the model has become more and more complex to include detailed mechanisms to represent a large variety of policies, obviously. So we have um, the prices or costs which are driving policies. These are things like taxes, etc. Uh, regulations uh, and standards and command and control measures. We have infrastructure policies and development plans. Uh, we have so-called enabling settings, which mean that in the context of decarbonization, for example, one assumes that batteries will develop in the infrastructure for batteries, for example, for transport will develop. We have the ETS, which has also become more complex over time with the market stability reserve. Um, we, have, we do multi-target uh, analysis uh, for simultaneous clearance of the ETS, the non-ETS targets, the rest, and the energy efficiency targets. Okay, and the whole thing is used, obviously, much for impact assessment studies. So to summarize the inputs and the outputs, so obviously inputs, GDP, fuel prices, taxes and subsidies, interest rates, risk premiums, etc., environmental and other kinds of policies, technical and economic capacities of current and future technologies, energy consumption habits, uh, comfort, the energy efficiency potential as a whole, uh, the parameters of the supply curves for primary energy, so what are the potentials, what are the costs related to that, and what are the outputs, so we have detailed energy balances, detailed demand projections by sector, detailed balance for electricity and steam, production of fuels, investment, activity of transport by modes and means and type of vehicles, uh, association of energy use and the activities, costs, CO2 emissions, and emissions and atmospheric pollutants, and then some policy assessment indicators, like the rest shares and all these things. And here, a small thing of what it can and can't do, but most important, at the end, to show it all. <laughs> so, okay, the distinctive feature is that we can combine the microeconomic foundation with the engineering at a fairly highly level of detail, uh, which is obviously somehow to be compatible for the long time scale and the sectorial detail available in the model. Um, it's designed to provide long-term energy system projections and uh, the restructuring up to 2050 and beyond, both in the demand and supply sectors. Um, okay, as I said, we do projections of the energy balances and all the related issues, the impact assessments, which can are uh, based on the price signals, on technology promoting policies, on the rest supporting policies, on the efficient and efficiency promoting policies, and the environmental policies. And then we are linked to um, other models to get the parts we don't have. Um, what it cannot do, it cannot deliver short-time forecasts, as we had yesterday in the discussion, obviously. Um, it does not by itself perform the closed loop, uh, loop to the economy. We need Demi-3 for that, but we have that in-house. Um, it cannot perform detailed short-term engineering analysis, for which we will have the next presentation. And, um, okay, and although it is rich in sectoral disaggregation, it has, anyway, a limited concept of representative consumer. It cannot substitute a fully sectoral model in all its detail, obviously. Um, okay, it lacks also spatial information. It is aggregated to simulate it, but obviously we don't have a gist behind the model. And um, it is an empirical numerical model with emphasis on sectoral and country-specific data, therefore not. We don't go below country data because that would be impossible computing time. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much. That was really full of information. Is there a question? Thank you, Lisa. Paul Dean, University College Cork. The, the structural changes and improvements 
that occurred since 2012 when the old set of reference results were produced and the more recent 2016 reference results. How have those improvements and changes impacted the final results? Um, so, in reality, for the most part, we find that the aggregations we had, I mean, basically, what we have done over time to a certain extent is that we have managed to have a higher disaggregation, both thanks to larger computers and to new thoughts of how to implement things. Um, and luckily, for the most part, we find that the more aggregate things that we find were more or less correctly simulating things. Um, but now we have a better view of how these things come to be. So, for example, before we had aggregate for example, we had a much more higher aggregation of the industrial boilers, for example. But in reality, obviously, an industrial boiler in the iron and steel industry is very different from a boiler in the ceramics industry, simply for size, for uh, lifetimes, etc. So obviously there you can see that um, there can be higher turnover, so that might be. But on the other hand, it is, let's say, compensated by the fact that the iron and steel industry, for example, has much longer lifetimes. So finally, we know now better where the different things come from, but the aggregate results are not that different. So basically, the main differences generally come from statistics, actually, <laughs> very often. Thank you. I, I I hope there's no important second question because the 50 minutes over. Thank you very much, Alasha, for this complete. Yeah.